tell us where you're from and just begin to share your life story. I'm from, uh, I'm from here, from Pasco, from Washington. And uh, I grew up here and stuff. And uh, as I was growing up, um, I kind of grew up in a broken home. So my mom was always chasing my dad because my dad was always leaving the house. So uh, in the mix of that, like I kind of had uh, no eyes on me. So I was able to come home whenever I wanted to. So I started going out and uh, started getting kind of into drugs and stuff like that. So at the age of 15, I became a part of this gang here. And uh, I kind of, uh, the same t- at that same time, I also got arrested for the first time. I went to uh, juvie for a possession of a firearm charge. And then from there on, like for the next couple of years, it was nonstop incarceration. I just kept going to jail every year. Every year I was in jail. It was a cycle that I was uh, kind of beginning to get stuck to. At the age of 17, I, uh, I have uh, a kid with this girl. And uh, I end up having another kid with this girl. But I don't know how to uh, have a good relationship because I never had that exampleship, so I messed that up. And uh, at the age of uh, 20, I go to prison. I get uh, charged for felon in possession of a firearm and uh, felony writing with a weapon. And uh, when I get out, when I'm in there, I have all this like great master plan of how when I get out, everything's going to work out like good for me and stuff like that. But um, when I get out, I get faced with all these uh, problems and stuff, and uh, I get a job, and I uh, I get my license released, and uh, as soon as I get my license released, uh, everybody knows where I'm at. Everybody starts garnishing me, and, like, life's not going as I planned it. And uh, life starts getting hard, and I start thinking of uh, giving up. And uh, so this girl that I know and stuff uh, from back then, uh, she kind of comes into my life again, and she comes, and she's talking to me, and she's sending me these invites to go to church. And uh, I didn't really want no, no nothing from church. I just got out of prison, and uh, we don't do church in prison, you know? <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, as uh, I continue and stuff like that, like um, I'm kind of uh, in a situation where everything just starts getting worse and worse and worse. I uh, get in an altercation with uh, my baby's mom's uh, new baby's dad and stuff like that. So uh, I get a restraining order, and then so I follow the parenting plan, and uh, I kind of get uh, back into drugs because uh, that's my escape. I'm already thinking of giving up and uh, going on the run. I'm on probation. I don't really care anymore, you know. And uh, as I go through this. Uh, this girl just keeps on like bugging me. She's just nonstop like bugging me, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I'm like, um, I get to this point where I get my ankle monitor, cut off my leg, I'm, like I'm, I'm free to go out. I get uh, with some friends, we have a meeting. There's uh, been some stuff that's been going on and a friend of ours got shot. So in the mix of all this, uh, we have uh, friends uh, on both sides that uh, we each lose and stuff like that. And uh, so I'm driving down um, Court Street and uh, there's a rival gang that's next to us, and I have my kids in the back. I got a chance to have my kids with me. And uh, I didn't tell nobody, I didn't tell my mom nothing like that because they would be mad. And so uh, they actually pointed guns at us, and uh, I, uh, I ended up telling my friend to take me home. We got taken home and stuff. And uh, that night, I, I remembered that when I got out that I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't be the person that my dad was for me, and I would be there for my kids, so I didn't want them... Uh, to, uh, to not be there without their father. And uh, if they would have shot that car, I would have lost my kids. I would have been dangerous to my kids, and I didn't want that for them. So uh, I didn't know what to do. I was desperate. I didn't know how to leave. I didn't know how to stop doing what I was doing. And um, God just kind of just sent this girl again, and she invites me to church. And I'm like, all right, like, um, I'll go to church, you know. So I uh, go to church, and I kind of do this prayer. Um, I, I do kind of don't really believe in God because the whole time my mom and I was growing up, she was always praying to God to uh, kind of restore her marriage, and God never did it, you know. So I was, uh, I was raised Catholic, so I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but uh, uh, yeah, so that happened. And uh, so I go to church, and while I'm at church, she uh, starts telling, uh, they start talking in the message and stuff. The message kind of hits me and stuff. So I go up to the altar, and I tell God, God, if, uh, if you're real, you got to show me that you're real because uh, I don't believe in you, and uh, but if you, but if I promise, I was like, if you show me that you're real, that I, that I will serve you and I will do everything that you want. And uh, so I, I meet this guy there, and his name's uh, Tony, and uh, he kind of becomes uh, the guy that I kind of connect with throughout the week. And uh, I was so desperate that I gave it just one week in prayer and everything, and and God didn't move and stuff. So uh, I kind of go back and try to give him his Bible, and I'm like, hey, um, hey, Tony, this isn't working for me and stuff like that. So. Before I could say anything, he just recommends a fast. He goes, uh, you should try to fasting and stuff like that. So I go on this three-day fast. And- Against your fasting. <laughs> yeah, I was desperate. So uh, 
I start uh, um, fasting. I do this fast. I kind of keep away from everybody. I don't want nobody bothering me. I lock myself in my room, and I take it serious. And um, three days pass by. Nothing happens. Uh, I'm already still thinking of giving up, you know. And um, I have, like, one week where everything kind of falls into order and stuff like that. And I have court for my restraining order because I got an altercation with my kids, uh, w- with their stepdad. And then uh, I also have my parenting plan. I had just gone through mediation. I was going to come and finalize my parenting plan. And I had messed up, and uh, I had to go see my probation officer, which I hadn't remembered yet. And so I end up uh, going in, like, I don't know where I thought I was on this lucky streak, and I end up uh, um, just uh, winning. I get my case dismissed for my, uh, for my restraining order, and then I don't know where I get my uh, favor, and I get half custody, which wasn't supposed to happen. I'm supposed to work, wait and kind of work my way through it, I get half custody, and I pass the UA that I'm not supposed to pass. And uh, from that UA, uh, I'm taking off, and I'm, I'm kind of, my sister's taking me home, and um uh, in the car, there was, uh, she was, she was a Christian. She tried to get me to church too, but I didn't go with her. <laughs> and, uh, so she's listening to this radio station called Caleb. And, uh, there's this guy on the radio named Luis Palan and he's talking about, uh, he goes, did you know that in the Hebrew language that there is no word for coincidence, that everything that happens is because God's ordained it that way. And the sooner that we start saying that it's, uh, not a coincidence, but start acknowledging, um, uh, that it's him, that the more we'll see the blessings poured out upon us. And uh, man, let's put our hands together for Jesus. Yes, God can even speak to you in the car through a radio. Yes. So um, I'm in the I'm in the car, and uh, to my sister, it doesn't seem like anything, but to me, like God was, I felt like God was telling me. He goes, "Nope, it's not a coincidence. It's me." So I look out the window, and we're driving down uh, the highway, and uh, I start kind of like God's reminding me of all the stuff that happened throughout the week, and I'm broken, and I know that God's been, like telling me, like, "No, that's me. It's not your coincidence. It's me." And uh, so I get home and stuff, and uh, I lock myself in the bathroom where nobody could see me because I'm still embarrassed of praying and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I get on my knees, and I pray, and I, and I tell God, like, all right, God, I see you, you know, and uh, um, uh, what do I do next? You know, I don't know what to do next and stuff, and uh, God's perfect timing, and uh, Diana calls me again. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, this uh, night service that they're doing on Fridays, and uh, so now I'm excited, and I'm like, all right, yeah, pick me up. I want to go, and uh, you go to the service, and... Uh, Man, the service just wrecks me, and I'm just all over. The, God's all over me, and uh, they do an altar call, and God's tugging me to go and to go to the altar. So I go to the altar, and uh, I give, I do the sinner's prayer, I give my life to Christ, and uh, I uh, just uh, remember uh, opening my eyes, and I was crying, and uh, I didn't want nobody to see me crying, so I walk out of there. And uh, so Tony um, becomes my mentor. He kind of just kind of guides me and teaches me, but something changed inside of me. Like I got this fire for God. And now I knew God was real. And I knew he was looking at me, so I was always, like, on uh, making sure that I, everything that I did was uh, what he wanted me to do. So I started cutting stuff out. Uh, my pride was one of the hardest things to cut out um, because uh, I didn't want none of my friends to see me. But they were doing an evangelism thing, and uh, I was like, you know what, God, I, um, I, I want to be sold out. I don't want to just do this thing halfway. <laughs> so um, I end up... Uh, Going and doing this stuff, and I'm on fire for God, and um, God's just pruning me, and it's, I'm just broken at the altar constantly. And um, I get to this point, three years, like, on fire, and I get with this girl, and um, kind of pulls me out again. I kind of wanted God to, to bless something that was in my will, not his will. And so he pulls, me, he pulls me, the devil pulls me back out, and I end up going to jail, and uh, I end up going back to jail for a crime. And um, God gets me alone, just me and him in the jail cell, and I have a Bible. And uh, I just remember that I was looking at it, felt convicted, and I started repenting, started uh, asking God to forgive me. And uh, I rededicated my life in, in a jail cell. And uh, so when I get out from there, I, I cut off everything. I don't, want, I don't want nothing. So I was tattooing back then, too. I cut out tattooing. Um, and it was a hard thing for me to do because I was making really good money. So I cut that out. I cut out unhealthy relationships, everything. And uh, I kept pushing forward. I was like, it's, it's not what I want. It's what he wants. And uh, that's what I'm going to decide to do. I'm doing this all the way. He doesn't want half my heart. He wants my whole heart. So. Hallelujah. Today, he has people that he brings every service, morning service, second service, Spanish service. Can you begin to t- just tell us just a little bit more what God is doing through your life? We know that it's not you. It's him just from your obedience to his sur- to surrender to him, what is he doing in your life now? Okay, so um, now that I've uh, kind of been, uh, m- like, rededicated my life and everything, and uh, 
now my kids are, I have a good relationship with my uh, kid's mom, and I'm able to bring my kids to church, and my kids come to church. My kid actually gave his life to Christ here on the stage. <laughs> and, uh, as, uh, as well as my nephew, my nephew came a couple of services ago and he gave his life to Christ. Um, he's bringing his mom today and his family, so they're coming. I have friends from the gang that I was from that are coming to church now as well. And um, yeah, God's just uh, using me and I'm, I'm just trying to be that willing vessel to bring people. Amen. From drug dealer to gospel dealer. Amen. So we're so excited. And what is your advice that you have for people that are maybe constantly backsliding or are into drugs and gangs? What do you want to tell them today? Um, just one thing that I, that I kind of uh, noticed in my life was uh, God wanted me to surrender some stuff and I was still trying to hold on to him. Most of the time, I think what keeps us going back is uh, is that we don't fully surrender. We kind of want God to bless uh, what we want and it's not, it doesn't work that way. God wants us to um, give that up, you know. Um, with obedience comes surrender, and um, you have to surrender. So every time I've ever come to the altar, I was coming to surrender something and to um, turn away from it and to not go back to it because uh, that one little foothold that I gave the enemy, it just pulled me right back, and uh, this time I'm, I'm watching everything, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking advice from everybody. So I'm uh, surrounded by leadership, and I have a good leadership here as well. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to push forward and uh, make sure you guys surround yourself with some uh, good people, um, Christian people that are doing good. <laughs> no Delilah's in your life, boys. Thank you so much. We appreciate your sharing. Let's put our hands together for Jesus.